Hey, Troop Loaders, I am Michael Stevens from the YouTube channel Vsauce. What was your background prior to uh, being a kick ass mocha? It's 4 o'clock GMT and this is Truth Loader Investigates with funky new credits. Yes. I like. <laughs> Yek <Yeksha mesh. laughs> And today we are talking about uh, cyborgs and turning yourself it's into a, a cyborg. It's a completely mental subject. <laughs> it is a little bit crazy. Basically this follows on from on Tuesday we did something on citizen science. We had a debate about citizen science and on next Tuesday we're doing a debate specifically about biohacking which is literally hacking up organisms bacteria, microbes, or us, to, uh, to improve them and make them better and make the world better. But today we're talking about a movement called the Grinder movement. Now, the what movement? <laughs> for those of you living in the UK, uh, <laughs> there is an app. You may have heard of it. There is an app. You may have heard of it. Um, we're talking about a different kind of augmentation today, <laughs> uh, adding, adding something slightly different to, your, to yourself. <laughs> Uh, we're talking about turning yourself into a cyborg. Uh, the grinding movement in this sense is turning yourself into a cyborg on the cheap, so let's find out a little bit more about it. The bodies we inhabit haven't changed much in tens of thousands of years. Bizarrely, our sense of smell has become less powerful, but as a whole, we've still got the same eyes, ears, nose, mouth and limbs as we always did. Which means that we've still got the same essential limitations that our ancestors did hundreds of thousands of years ago. We're slow, weak, and prone to failure. Which is why we have technology to help us out and boost the areas in which we fall flat. From prosthetic limbs to artificial hearts, technology is pushing the limits of what we can achieve. But increasingly, this technology has been taken out of the lab and the hospital and tested by people in their basements and bedrooms all around the world, in a collective known as biohackers. These are people who make implants for one another, open source technology which allows them to do everything from feeling electromagnetic lines to reading their vital signs and uploading it online. Welcome to the world of grinding, body augmentation on the cheap. I loved that bit where the guy picked up the, the, yeah. the magnetic stuff, it's, it was a bit like something out of Star Wars. It's astonishing isn't it, he's completely blind and he's holding that that little box we'll talk more about that in a moment but he's got a magnet in his fingertips and he can feel magnetic lines and so people are just taking electronic devices and putting them inside themselves that's basically, basically what it is right yeah basically i mean it's you can get these uh, t-shirts i don't know if you've seen them you can get t-shirts that have kind of audio equalizers on them and if you walk past the music the t-shirt will kind of change color in, in line with the music it's that kind of thing but people are sticking it under their skin so that your skin lights up in time, in, in kind of tune to the music and in the volume with the volume of the music. Why? It's, well, <laughs> wow, uh, that's a question we haven't <laughs> I'm prepared for. Uh, I'm <laughs> that just, all right, I, I totally understand no. the need to pick stuff up like Absolutely, this, right? Yeah, yeah. Without touching it, that is cool. Putting lights in your arm, yeah. Well, it's it kind of started off as an artistic movement, but there is some real science behind it. I mean, you people have been doing this stuff for, for decades. When computers first came out, people would hack computers apart and put them together in different ways. People have been playing with radio controlled stuff for years and you know radio waves for years. And this is kind of the next step. We've got to a stage now where you can read useful things about yourself through computers. So why not put the computer inside yourself? It's no, the why logical not? next why not? step. Yeah, it's so, <laughs> so inconvenient having a computer on the outside. Absolutely. Well, and you'd never, you'd never forget where you put it, would you, if it was in your hand at all times. Uh, anyway, it's probably best that we hear from someone who's actually done this to find out what inspires him rather than us speculating <laughs> and mocking them. Uh, it's not our intention. Uh, uh, Sean Sarver builds implants for a company called Grindhouse Wetwares and he told us a little bit about their movement. This has always been my, uh, I guess, fascination with uh, science fiction. Um, and just the idea that you could be a cyborg, that that was a possibility, and the fact that the technology was catching up to the point where we could start doing that. 
I was just I was ready for it. The numbers of people interested in wetware and um, cybernetics is you know probably maybe a couple thousand people on the plant, so it's not very big right now. Um, everyone that's currently doing it's also bolstering like this technology is here. So we're trying to get the word out like, hey, this is a real thing now. It's not just science fiction. It's now science fact that you can start to augment yourself. And I think that people who are getting enthusiastic about it and setting up a little lab in their basement or in a room somewhere they're not using and learning you know, the, the scientific principles and engineering principles, I think that's a great thing. So one of the things that you mentioned there, mm. one of the words that you mentioned was wetware. Yeah. What is wetware? Well, this is slightly grim, but you've got software, which is code that people type out. It's, it's soft, you can't really touch it. You've got hardware, which is microchips, which you can pick up their physical their hardware. It's called wetware because it's covered in blood. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. Um, basically. But there is some hard science behind this. I mean, Sean has uh, his background is in the American Air Force. He is an electronics engineer, and people are taking this stuff pretty seriously. You know, people really want to expand on what we can do as human beings. I mean, we might mock it gently, but we can't feel I'm, electromagnetic waves through I'm, our fingers, yeah. and he can. And that would so, be something that I would like to do. But I'm not. I, you know, I'm not mocking it. I, do, I just don't understand it. And you know, I, do, I just <laughs> I want to understand. I think that's part of the fear, isn't it? That people. You know, you, if you don't understand things, as I, I'll be honest, I don't understand the attraction either. I think it's a fascinating subject, though. But these people, they, they are really pushing boundaries, and a fair, a fair play to them. They are sticking this stuff into them. Uh, it's probably about time that we had a little look at what Grindhouse Wetwares do. So here's a couple of the projects that Sean has been working on. One of the pioneers of the wetware movement is Grindhouse, an American company dedicated to creating open source implants which can be bought and modified by anyone. Here is our um, ping sensor which works on uh, ultrasonic frequencies. Among their first projects are the bottlenose, which alongside a magnet in the finger can help the user pick up sonar and even Wi-Fi signals. Next up, the thinking cap a brain stimulator which can affect how active or inactive various parts of the brain become, based on the wearer's preference. And finally, the HELEDD, a device which records essential medical information about the wearer and collates it for later viewing. All of these technologies are built out of standard parts, and the group says that's the whole point. We're kind of a, a weird cross between a, a co-op company and a hacker collective. We make devices that expand the human experience or give an enhancement, some people call it. We do it using open source technology. Uh, that's kind of one of the key points of what we do. Um, we see a future where augmentation is going to become common, so we want it to be open source so that people have control over their own bodies. So all of this stuff's open source, right? Yeah. Does that mean, does that mean it just comes as separate parts that people put together for themselves and design their own implements? Or? It, it can do, yeah. I mean, the Grindhouse Wetwares, they provide products in kind of a finished state, but they also provide the technical information and other people provide the technical information so that you can take it apart, mix and match the bits that you want. You can go down to you know, Radio Shack if you're in the US or I guess Maplin is the equivalent in the UK. You can buy bits, you can plug them all in and, and do whatever you want with it and then stick it inside yourself. Sounds... <laughs> Sounds lovely. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I think it's a fascinating thing. You know, it, it started off as kind of um, part of the, the body modification movement. So you've got piercings and you've got tattoos, and you see some really extreme examples of people who've literally turned themselves into vampires, like that person with the horns, like the horns, or... people with the horns, and you know the massive, great big spikes that go through one sure. side of the face and out the other. And this is the next logical step. If you can turn yourself into a vampire, why not turn yourself into something with some kind of scientific value, some kind of robotic cyborg droidy thing? <laughs> but I, yeah, I think it's fascinating. But it, is, it isn't just science. There is an artistic element to it as well. Uh, so let's take a look at some of the people who've been using this for kind of cultural expansion as well. Wetware isn't just the preserve of techno freaks and the fringes of society. It's also being used as a unique form of art. Meet Rob Spence, the eyeborg, who replaced his glass eye with a 3G connected camera, able to film his surroundings wow. and then upload them to the internet. The eye also tracks. It moves. You see blinking and glancing, which is a very actual human point of view.
view. This is the classic shot, me shooting the cameraman. Or we'll take a look at Iraqi-born artist Wafa Bilal, who might just be taking a look at you. In collaboration with a museum in Doha, a camera was surgically implanted into the back of his skull. Not a project for the squeamish, this one. Every minute for an entire year, Waffer's third eye automatically took and uploaded a photograph to the museum's website, following his life from behind as he travelled around New York sleeping, eating and working. I'm interested in these corners of our lives that we don't pay attention to. I'm interested in the mundane of these images. Hmm. Whether well, traditional tattoos and piercings have much competition remains to be seen. Why the? What, why couldn't he just put a head strap on? <laughs> or, you know, just have have something. Just doesn't have to have it implanted. That's mm. my first point. Yeah, I can answer in a second. <laughs> and second of all, this is much cooler. The guy, the guy. Uh, what was his name with the eye? Uh, Spence, I think it was. Yeah, his name. Rob Spence. Rob Spence. Right. I, I've, I have actually heard of him before, and mm. one of the one of the side effects <laughs> of that is that if he looks into a viewfinder of a camera, um, he starts getting headaches because of the horrible feedback loop, which yeah. I think is pretty nuts. He goes he goes meta on himself. <laughs> yeah. if he looks yeah. into a camera, so that little trick shot that he does <laughs> is actually hugely painful for him. Um, and I think actually, uh, talking about Rob Spence, he is involved, I think, in our debate on Tuesday. I think he yeah. said he can do it, so hopefully he'll be joining us on Tuesday at four o'clock for our debate on biohacking. But yeah, I, I take you on your first point. There is no real logical answer for that. <laughs> you see people with GoPros all the time. There's all sorts yeah. of different mounts. He could have got an adhesive mount, just shaved yes. a bit of his head and got an adhesive mount, and that would have been fine. He didn't need to have it implanted, but like screwed into the back of his head. And by the way, some of the footage from that is absolutely <laughs> disgusting. So Sam has cleaned it up. I have you. cleaned it up slightly. the sanitised version. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is probably a good time to say that uh, we don't recommend that you try this stuff at home on, on your own. If you are going to do this stuff, firstly, seek help, psych psychological and medical. Uh, and <laughs> But if you, uh, if you are going to do it at home, please, please, please do get a registered piercer to do it. Someone who knows a little bit about anaesthetic and you know, infection control, for example, because that could go horribly wrong on so many levels, particularly if you are drilling a camera into the back of your skull. <laughs> we can't recommend enough that you don't try that. But <laughs> yeah, don't, please, no, God. Please, please just do not go try pro it. on the back of the head if you're considering doing that. But anyway, it's already been done, so you're just copying someone else's art. Find something <laughs> original which I think is probably a good time to bring us on to the safety aspect yeah. of all this, because obviously people hacking themselves up to stick microchips into them isn't necessarily the safest thing to be doing. Uh, so surely designing things and building them and sticking them into you isn't actually a particularly good idea? Whilst most experts recommend a registered piercer sorts their implant out for them, there are always a few who insist on taking the theme of home body augmentation to its logical extreme, including Left Anonym, whose attempts at self-surgery have landed her in hospital. I, I have no budget, no money, no anything. So all I work with is stuff that you can get in a kitchen. So far this has been mostly successful, with a lot of pain and a lot of side effects. And I would like to say to all of you, if you're considering anything, got any projects, please put them completely under the skin. Don't think of having things hanging out because it goes so wrong so fast. Just because you can leave it in the bath for three days doesn't mean it's fine inside your hand. You have to test things or let me test them. Transdermal implants, bad idea. Nasty, stinky sepsis, bad. <laughs> it's almost impossible to keep them clean. So infection aside, just how safe is it putting something you at best bought online, at worst made yourself out of bits of old radio, into your body? Is it really clever to allow a piece of technology to, essentially, play with you? What if it breaks? What if the battery leaks or something goes wrong in the fitting? Even the best piercers aren't first in installing electronics, and whilst open source may be liberating, it's also potentially lethal to those experimenting with it. So, hmm. nasty sepsis, things hanging out of you, getting infected, any other risks? Um, I'm sold, personally, I think. <laughs> sounds, sounds beautiful. Dirty, stinky yeah. sepsis. Dirty, stinky sepsis. 
Uh, and I, I also like that her idea of testing to make sure that it was safe was to leave it in the bath for three days. Yeah. I can't imagine how sepsis possibly set in <laughs> after it was there. That does seem like the her. most hygienic place in the house. Yes. Um, well, Leth is, is one of the most extreme examples, we should say. She really does take to herself with a kitchen knife. She... No anaesthetic and she will stick things no into No anaesthetic? Her. No anaesthetic. She, no. She just uh, cuts herself open and sticks things inside herself and sews herself shut again. So that really is the extreme end of it. Uh, she she's a fascinating been, person, I mean, <laughs> though. Really fascinating, as you'd have to be to cut yourself open. Has she ever yourself. done herself any serious damage by... Sepsis? Yeah, 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 but I mean, like, has she ever, like, is it caused permanent, permanent damage? Um, I think she's okay. Okay. I think, she, I think she's all good. Basically, what she was trying to do, she was trying to create a, an implant which would give a readout of her internal temperature as it kind of uh, dips and troughed through the day. Yes, there are other options are available. <laughs> uh, this one was a homemade computerized version of it though, which uh, didn't particularly work. Right, yeah, it doesn't sound uh, like But it. the rest of that talk is fascinating. We'll try and put a link in the description because uh, she is a fascinating woman and- uh, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, fair play. And she's done some amazing expect. things to her own body. <laughs> which that she should enjoy wasn't her one of them. <laughs> Anyway, the safety issue is kind of the obvious question that's raised. But Lucas, who is the guy we heard from before from uh, Grindhouse Wetwares, he disagrees. He says that actually there are flaws, of course there are, but they're being ironed out by pioneers and early manufacturers. There's, there's some concerns with implanting devices with batteries because there's you know, the issue of leaking. But in terms of implant rejection, we have silicone that's been used um, for up to 60 years, I believe. Uh, and it's used extensively in... Um, both body modification and in and for medical implants. Um, so people get you know huge horseshoes and they get they get horns and these things don't reject. So uh, that's not a concern. The main concern is is putting in parts that could fail in an individual. So that's why we have an entire team in Grindhouse dedicated to uh, testing these devices under biological conditions, just to make sure that, you know, someone's arm doesn't explode. All right. Is the silicone that they're using the same silicone that was found to be slightly dodgy, possibly, when there were PIP implant scandals all around Europe? Well, yeah. Because... Yeah. Silicon is, yes. Silicon has had its problems. I'm sure that these guys are doing it right. They're trying sure. very hard to do it safely and do it properly. But yes, silicon. Things go wrong. Small issues. Things do go wrong, and, <laughs> and that's you know, why that's why there's people out there pioneering this stuff, giving themselves sepsis, so that in future <laughs> we can find out what temperature we are. But there were there were doc there were doctors who were putting breast implants into women mm. and men, um, and they they were splitting. They were rupturing. So what's to stop this doing the same? That's why. I mean, you may not have an answer. I I would I. Be, I don't so, have an answer. I think it's one of many potential pitfalls mm. of trying to stick electronics into yourself at home. Okay. One, one, of, one of many. That is the main reason I'm not going to do this. But he's specifically looking at not having your arms exploding. Right, okay. Which is comforting. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Good to know there's somebody looking out for that. So, of course, people are taking this. I mean, the thing to take away from this is that it's a very small niche movement that's just kind of starting to take off as people realise that actually you really can start to modify yourself and you can start to turn yourself into a cyborg. There are going to be pitfalls. People are going to get hurt as they do with these things. You know, I imagine the first few people who tried to fly a plane <laughs> probably didn't get very far before hitting the ground at incredible speed. <laughs> uh, but that's where technology grows from. And now we can safely fly across the Atlantic and eventually we'll be able to sprout wings from our no, back and do exactly the same thing. That is a good point. These guys, these guys are pioneers, like you say. They are, and they're taking the risk so that in the future, if we want to, you know, if I want to have a sat nav implanted into my back so that people behind me can tell where I'm going on a daily basis, then that's possible, <laughs> and they'll be able to do that. So many options. <laughs> so many, many options. Speaking of which, uh, Sean gave us his thoughts on what he thinks the future of the movement will be. Uh, I'm like, I'd say in 10 years' time, I would hope to see um, a yeah, mainstream acceptance of, like, of human augmentation technology. Like, it's like to see them come kind of like commonplace, you know, Something like, oh, I modded my eyes so I can see, you know, infrared would become, you know, a little bit more commonplace, I guess. That is a fair point, I suppose. Like, most scientific yeah. theories at some point seem like, I don't know, take, take the theory of evolution. Mm. At, at, at first, everybody 
hated on Darwin for that one. <laughs> and then and then eventually people have come round to it. The vast yeah. majority of people have come round to it, obviously. Absolutely. Not everyone, but <laughs> you know, yeah, maybe this will become more mainstream. Yeah, I, I, I hope it does personally. We, I mean, we've done a lot, quite a bit of stuff on this before. We've done some uh, some packages on Google Glass. We've interviewed a guy called Kevin Warwick who uh, had chips implanted in his arm so that he could log onto computers and he can drive a wheelchair using his brain. And he, he wired his wife's brain up to his arm. Uh, so he is doing some really extreme <laughs> stuff. He's kind of the hero of the movement. No? What was, what was the purpose of wiring? This is slightly off topic, but what's the purpose of wiring up his arm to his wife's brain? Uh, just because he could. To get it done, to make it happen. So, yeah. so her brain controls his arm? For, uh, for, at the time it did, yes. Right, okay. Uh, it was wired up and she could, you know, raise and lower his right arm. Started doing some more washing up. Um, and, but these are pioneers. These are pioneers and these are people who are really making this stuff happen. And who knows, you've got the Raspberry Pi now. There is a computer that you can buy for 20 quid that you can make do whatever you want. Mm. It's just, a, it's an open source piece of technology that's designed to inspire and create and get people involved in the technology and I think this is part of the same thing. I'm kind of in awe of these guys. We're having a bit of a laugh about it but I think, I think it's pretty neat actually. It yeah. could be. If they, if, they, if they can find something really really useful that benefits everybody then more people might start accepting that yeah, you can have absolutely. stuff inside you that can make you better, yeah. more advanced. And frankly I would like to see him for red. Yeah. I think that would be cool. Speaking of which, actually, we're, that's kind of uh, everything we've got to say on uh, on the grinder movement today, on, on grinding uh, and on, on wetware. But we've got a couple of other things to talk about because it's been quite a busy week for kind of science and technology. And speaking of infrared and microwave radiation, the Planck Telescope, which is the European Space Agency's kind of uh, big telescope. Megascope. Megascope. It looks back to the dawn of time, literally to the dawn of time. It scans the sky looking for cosmic background radiation, which is the leftovers of the Big Bang itself. And um, you've got an interesting fact about yes, this. Yes, I do. But you're itching, I can <laughs> see. Yeah, yeah. I've been waiting all week to tell people about this. So, you know when you get static on an analog TV, the, the sort of white fuzzy stuff, most people don't get it anymore because we now have digital, we have HD, we have plasma, we have LCD and all that. So most people don't suffer from this problem anymore. But back in the day when we used to have analog TVs, um, you get that white noise, mm. and one percent of that is caused by the uh, Big Bang, by cosmic rays. So, you watch that old TV, you're actually seeing yep. the Big Bang happen. Only one percent of it. One percent. One percent of the Big Bang. And that's astonishing, though. Amazing the rest of it's fact. going. We are the ninety-nine percent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Listen to us. Occupy TV. We need interesting facts too, but they, you know. That's amazing, though. But um, anyway, this this telescope scans for this radiation. This incredible tiny differences in, in microwave radiation and temperature in the universe. And uh, we've got some footage of it here actually that we can, uh, we can show you. And uh, this is how it, how it works. It kind of rotates around and just scans the sky. But it turns out the universe is 80 million years older than we thought. That sounds like quite a long way out, but I it, suppose in, in universe time absolutely. it's probably not. Yeah, when you're 13,000 million years old, <laughs> 80 million, Actually, we got it pretty close, but I mean, this is what the telescope does. It, it spins around and it creates a map of the sky. But it's absolutely astonishing that we can, down to 80 million years, down to a pinprick in the history of evolution and the universe and everything, that's how old the universe is. And it's still there. You can still detect it. And we're still seeing it today. Isn't that a little bit mind blowing? It's a little bit of a mind blow. And it's really... I, I find this stuff quite moving. I know science and everything, it's, you know, it's a bit geeky, but I genuinely get moved by that, that we can still see. Yeah, that's see incredible. That far back. Absolutely astonishing. It's, didn't, wasn't there something they had to do, like clear, clear away some of the, the brighter lights from, yeah. from that image to, to allow people to see the, the original lights? Absolutely, like. yeah. It's kind of like listening to, I guess, listening to an old vinyl record. Show my age oh. there, aren't <laughs> How does that happen? Well, you know, as you listen, as you listen to it more and more, it's kind of when it's new, it's all fresh and it sounds wonderful, and eventually it kind of wears out a little bit, and uh, the sound quality dips, and that's essentially what's happening with the universe. But you can still see that oh, the remnants of the Big Bang. I think it's wonderful. Anyway, <laughs> talking about almost as old things, Voyager One. There's been a huge argument this week in the scientific community. Has Voyager One left the solar system? Has it? No. <laughs> 
No, it hasn't. Elvis is still just about in the building. <laughs> He's kind of munching on a burger somewhere <laughs> near the fire escape. Somewhere escaped. near the car, <laughs> Yeah, hovering around the toilet, uh, just waiting to vanish and become <laughs> a bit of a tourist attraction. Uh, that was a metaphor that went horribly wrong roughly halfway through. Uh, anyway, Voyager is still in the solar system. Basically, we don't know what happens when you get that far out. There's kind of a bubble around the sun. Is it close to the edge? Yeah, yeah it's that... really, really close to the edge. It's, uh, it's 12 billion miles away now. And it's entered this area. Basically, you've got the you've got the sun, and the sun has a huge effect in terms of gravity, but also it pumps out a whole load of radiation. And eventually, that radiation backs up against the radiation from the rest of the galaxy, from the rest of the universe. And there's kind of it's almost like a, a wavy line, like the Northern Lights, and that's called the helio helio sheath. And then there's helio pause, which is where the two magnetic lines are kind of equal. And then you've got then you're into galactic space, and it's kind of hovering somewhere between the two. But no one really knows just how big that space is. Right. So, will it leave the universe eventually? Well, it won't leave the universe. <laughs> Sorry, the, the solar system. The solar system. <laughs> I got lost about halfway through that explanation with the heliosphere and the uh, heliosphere. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I'm fairly simple. I, and I just, I, this is awe oh, for me. Oh, science. Oh, sexy thing. Um, can't get enough of those helio pauses. Uh, <laughs> it's been flying since 1977 Voyager. It's got fuel to last it until about 2020, so we've got another eight years for it to cross into interstellar space. It'll probably do it, but it's not quite done it yet. Is what the happens consensus then? Of NASA. Um, Who knows? Is that the point? Yeah, <laughs> basically it's it's a mystery. Everything it's doing now is is creating new science. Every meter it flies. And we love new science. And we love new science. Especially science. Over investigate, especially me. Oh, science. And on that note, it's time to leave for the weekend. I have to get home and open a copy of National Geographic. <laughs> uh, uh, I think on that note, it's I think we should probably go. time to go. <laughs> Thank you very much.